I wanna begin by acknowledging that Columbia has been late to this conversation. Incidents of discrimination and violence against Asian and Asian Pacific Islanders have been happening in the US for generations. This is yet another example of structural racism in our country. It is embedded in our nation's government, policies, and culture. From the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 to colonialism in the Philippines, to World War II Japanese internment camps, to state just a few. Our last president began his political career and grew his vervid base by bracing his supporters against invasions and infestations of immigrants and asylum seekers who were coming for our jobs. COVID-19 renewed the delusion of the looming threat of China, and by extension, those of Asian descent in America. The tactic is not new. Externalize the problem, shift the blame, demonize and dehumanize the foreigner. It is not surprising that after Trump tweeted the term China virus last year, anti-Asian violence spiked. The organization Stop AAPI Hate, which was created last March, received almost 4,000 reports of anti-Asian discrimination in the past year, with women being twice as likely as men to be involved. The new administration has taken initial steps to address this issue. President Biden's memorandum combating AAPI xenophobia issued during his first week in office acknowledges the damage done by this xenophobic rhetoric and the resulting spike in bullying, harassment, and hate crimes against AAPI individuals. Though an important step, this executive action is not enough. Over the past year, Columbia has made a profound introspective turn to better understand how racism affects those who work and study here. In 2020, the nation's focus was on anti-Black racism as throngs of protesters took to the streets in response to state-sponsored murders. The recent mass shooting in the Atlanta spa reminds us that anti-Asian hate is still an urgent concern for our nation. The broader issue in question is white supremacy and we must galvanize as a community to combat it. We are happy to announce the formation of the Columbia University Asian Faculty Association, which seeks to one, advocate for its members as a representative body for the benefit of Columbia University and the community at large. Two, to foster intellectual and professional interaction among its members. Three, to provide a support network and promote the career and leadership advancement of its members at Columbia University. And four, to promote academic and cultural exchange between Columbia University and other institutions and organizations domestically and internationally. If you would like more information about this group, please email us at facultyadvancement at columbia.edu. It is my pleasure to turn it over this afternoon to our Executive Vice President for Arts and Sciences, Amy Hungerford. Thank you, Amy. Dennis, thank you so much. And <clears throat> thank you for your leadership through what has been um, a tremendously difficult time. It is um, reassuring to all of us, challenging to all of us, um, in all the ways that you um, you bring the problem of white supremacy and the need to change in our institution, in our society before us, um, week in and week out. So we are so grateful for that work. Um, it is my very great pleasure to introduce um, the moderator and convener of this panel, uh, Professor Eli Hasama from the Department of Music. Um, she has a specialty in music theory and historical musicology, um, and that work focuses on many forms of music, dance, visual arts, and public engagement. Um, and she thinks about it, uh, all those forms of art, um, rigorously in the context of gender, race, and sexuality, um, and other social and political um, rubrics and frames. She has uh, been a core faculty member in the Institute for Research on Women, Gender, and Sexuality, um, putting her right at the core of, of um, an intellectual community looking at intersectional issues. Um, she's the author of Gendering Musical Modernism, the music of Ruth Crawford, Marion Bauer, and Miriam Gideon, and the co-author of volumes 
on um, Ruth Crawford Seeger's Worlds, uh, Innovation and Tradition in 20th Century American Music, and a volume called Critical Minded, New Approaches to Hip Hop Studies. Um, as many of you know, Ellie will be leaving Columbia in July to take over as the Dean of the School of Music at the University of Toronto. Um, this is incredibly exciting as a new direction for her leadership and uh, we wish you the best, Ellie. We will miss you sorely um, and can't wait to watch you um, shine in that new, in that new role. Uh, we know that you will bring intelligence, ethics, commitment to diversity, inclusion, uh, and creativity to that new position. Uh, for 15 years here at Columbia, Ellie has been absolutely indispensable as a citizen and member of our community. Um, to name just a little bit of her service, uh, and this is where I, as a newcomer to, um, to Columbia about 18 months ago, first heard of her work. Um, she chaired the ANS Academic Review Committee, which is a really um, important role uh, reviewing units and really brought the consideration of DEI issues um, into, the, into the regular routine work of that of that uh, important uh, committee. She served on the board of the Heyman Center for the Humanities, and she's currently on our Committee for Equity and Diversity um, and on the Provost Leadership Council. She led the humanities portion of our recent ANS wide um, equity study, which was really a watershed moment in our work to become a more equitable, fair, and diverse institution. Um, Naming all those committees though, and those efforts doesn't really capture Ellie's um, distinctive contributions to Columbia over all these years. Um, she has been a fearless advocate for equity, inclusion, and diversity. And as a devoted teacher and mentor, she's played a huge role in so many lives. Um, something that was recognized when she was awarded the inaugural um, faculty mentoring award in 2020. Those qualities were also clear when Ellie organized a day long event to remember and celebrate the life of our late colleague, Marcellus Blount. Um, and on that occasion, she brought together an astonishing group of colleagues, students and friends, um, combining a scholarly celebration with dance um, and herself uh, delivering what by all accounts was a moving tribute um, that showed us her as a critical thinker, but also as um, an empathic and uh, kind human being and companion in, in our collective life. Um, she has, uh, as with today's event, um, been uh, a mover for public programming that really matters to us. Um, and so I'll give just one more example. Um, she was the founding director of the workshop um, for the Daughters of Harlem, Working in Sound, that's the name of the workshop. And they work with uh, local public school students uh, bringing them to campus. Um, Ellie, you are in a class by yourself. We know that you will lead us today in a, an important uh, conversation that we really need to have uh, as a university. So thank you for that work. And I very much look forward to hearing what you and our distinguished colleagues will say today. Thank you so much, Dennis and Amy, for your eloquent words and for your leadership on these critically important issues. Um, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement co-written with my colleague, Zasha DeCastri. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are speaking from the unceded traditional land of the Munze Lenape, known today as Harlem. We wish to recognize the history of colonization and settlement here where Columbia University sits since its founding in 1754 by Royal Charter of King George II of England. We must remember that the US government forced the migration of the Lenape from this land to Oklahoma where many descendants of those who were removed now reside. We acknowledge the numerous enslaved Africans and their descendants whose forced labor contributed to the wealth of many educational institutions and this nation and whose sacrifice has not yet been compensated nor adequately recognized to this day. 
This violence underwrites the history of our academic institution and all who live and work in Harlem. Please consider the lives, culture, and legacy of those who came before us as we honor and pay our respect for their contributions. The title of this panel, We Have to Reimagine, is drawn from the words of Grace Lee Boggs, the philosopher, revolutionary thinker, activist, and alumna of Barnard College. In a 2012 conversation with Angela Davis, Bob declares, we have to reimagine. She continues, we have to do what I call visionary organizing. We have to see every crisis as both a danger and an opportunity. It's a danger because it does so much damage to our lives, to our institutions, to all that we have expected. But it's also an opportunity for us to become creative, for us to become the new kind of people that are needed at such a huge period of transition. And that's why it's wonderful to be here today, that we dare to talk about revolution in such fundamental terms. Yesterday's historic verdict in Minneapolis, born out of crisis, a crisis that we have witnessed so many times, rests on a collective effort to listen and to see differently, to speak against systemic racism and white supremacy. The many acts of racist harassment, discrimination, and assault of Asians and Asian Americans so visible in the last year in which Asians of many ethnicities were scapegoated for the pandemic should be viewed in terms of the larger history of racist violence and white supremacy that shapes all of our lives. We affirm our solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement and hope that we may work in concert towards a world not stained by racism, sexism, xenophobia, and other forms of hatred. In the words of Audre Lorde, an alumna of Columbia, the fact that we are here, and that I speak these words, is an attempt to break that silence and to bridge some of those differences between us, for it is not difference which immobilizes us, but silence, and there are so many silences to be broken. By continuing to crack the edifice of racism and sexism, we hope to be able to build a world of beauty, safety, wellness, and care for each other. This panel emerged with a discussion with several colleagues, including those here today. We wanted to see more discussion at the university about anti-Asian racism and violence, the myth of the model minority and perpetual foreigner, the history of racism directed towards Asians here and elsewhere, and to collectively reimagine a future in which racism has been eradicated. Today's session is, we hope, part of a series of conversations, workshops, teach-ins, and other programming that will help to tell our stories, to counter the stereotypes that many of us live within every time we step into a classroom or walk down Broadway. I'm pleased to note that we have nearly 600 registrants for today's event and hope that you will continue to join us in this ongoing work of anti-racism. I'm thrilled to introduce five distinguished colleagues who are part of these ongoing conversations, and we look forward to your ideas and initiatives for further anti-racist work. We are grateful to the Office of the Vice Provost for Faculty Advancement and to the Committee on Equity and Diversity in Arts and Sciences for supporting this event. Please see the full list of co-sponsors and the speaker bios in your event booklet, which is available through the link coming to you through the chat. The format for our panel is that each person will speak in turn and will devote the last portion of our meeting to questions submitted when you registered, as well as questions posted during today's live event. 
At the close of today's session, we will share a few resources upon which we hope to build in the coming weeks into the next academic year. Our first speaker is Mei Nye, who is Lung Family Professor of Asian American Studies, Professor of History, and Co-Director of the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race at Columbia. She is a US legal and political historian interested in questions of immigration, citizenship, and nationalism. She's the author of the award-winning Impossible Subjects, Illegal Aliens, and the Making of Modern America, and The Lucky Ones, One Family, and the Extraordinary Invention of Chinese America. Welcome, May. Thank you very much, Ellie, and thank you, Vice Provost uh, Dennis Mitchell. Um, it's uh, a very difficult time for all of us, and um, it's a little scary going first, but I'm the historian, so um, here I am. Uh, the late Afro-British sociologist Stuart Hall famously wrote that we ought to understand not racism in general, but racisms. According to Hall, racism might be everywhere, a deeply anti-human and anti-social practice, but it is not everywhere the same. Specific histories, contexts, and environments produce particular racisms, he said. In the United States, there's much to unpack to understand the myriad of racisms that are shot through our history and our present, and how each strand of experience is unique as well as related to others. In the 19th century, white Americans faced the prospect that Chinese might become a significant portion of the population of the United States. In response, they passed a series of laws excluding Chinese from immigration and citizenship. The justification for exclusion was that Chinese were an unassimilable race and therefore could never be or become Americans. The Supreme Court upheld race-based exclusion as a matter of national security. Exclusion soon extended to all Asians and remained in US law until 1952. Its rationale that Asians pose a racial danger to American society has endured in our politics and culture to this day. In the spirit of our theme today, reimagine, let's imagine for a moment that there had been no exclusion laws and that Chinese and other Asians continue to freely immigrate to the United States. The country would look radically different today. By 1950, there would be many millions of Asian Americans building their lives in the United States and in the process contributing to the country. Instead, that year, there were a mere 320,000 Asian Americans, just two tenths of 1% of the US population. Since the immigration reforms of 1965, the number of Asian Americans has increased, but we are still less than 6% of the US population. Yet many Americans still believe there are too many Asians here and that we don't belong. For Asian Americans, the history of exclusion looms as large as slavery and Jim Crow do for black people. This association is more than a metaphor. In the late 19th century, Jim Crow and Chinese exclusion were related projects of white supremacy. They were two models of racial management necessary for white supremacy after the Civil War, when the West and the South were being integrated into a national economy based on corporate capital and a polity made up of white male voters. In the South, the old planter class and new industrialists responded to the prospect of equality for the former slaves with a reign of terror that gutted their citizenship, stripped them of the franchise and their civil rights. The dangers that white supremacists associated with black citizenship provided an object lesson for why Chinese should be excluded. Chinese exclusion did not pass Congress without debate, but opposition was limited by the same racial fatigue in the North that had recently sold out reconstruction. A reactionary political alliance of the West and the South pushed the exclusion laws through Congress. The West and the South, strongholds of red states on today's political map. Now, let me take a step back and discuss why Chinese were considered such a racial danger in the West. The Chinese first came in large numbers during the California Gold Rush of 1848 and 49, which crowned the continental expansion of the United States. 
Under the sign of Manifest Destiny, the idea that the West was God's gift to white Protestant America, the United States had gone to war with Mexico and annexed its northern half. Westward expansion subsumed the sectional conflict over slavery and annexed its northern half. I'm sorry, subsumed the sectional conflict over slavery and committed genocide of indigenous peoples across the plains and the West. When Euro-American settlers arrived at the edge of the continent, they celebrated their conquest of the West and the closing of the frontier. From there, they looked across the Pacific, the next frontier, with both excitement at the prospect of new conquests and anxiety over new peoples that might come. The idea of manifest destiny continued to define the dominant vision of the United States as a white man's country for at least a century. Hostility against Chinese was justified with the racial argument that Chinese were indentured workers or a coolie race that posed an existential threat to free whites. This was a lie. The Chinese in California were voluntary immigrants and independent gold prospectors, not indentured workers. The coolie myth invoked two contemporary anxieties. One was the use, mainly by the British, of in Indian indentured labor in the Caribbean plantation colonies after the abolition of slavery. The other was the more proximate example of slavery in the American South. These two associations, colonialism and slavery, inspired racist theories against the Chinese. Anti-Kuliism also stereotyped all Chinese women as prostitutes, dubbing them slave girls, female counterparts to male coolie laborers. The Page Act of 1875 prohibited immigration of so-called Mongolian prostitutes with the aim of preventing Chinese population growth through natural reproduction. That left a legacy of separated families and established the enduring stereotype of Oriental women as both desirable and dangerous. Racisms, while originating in specific contexts, must also be continually reproduced in order to remain potent. Hence, the Western states erected an edifice of laws that forbade Asians from marrying white people, attending white schools, testifying in court against whites, owning agricultural property, and holding commercial and professional licenses. Most of these laws remained in force until the late 1940s, when Black civil rights activism defeated similar restrictions against African Americans. The Asiatic exclusion laws themselves fell during World War II and the Cold War, the result of foreign policy imperatives. Immigration opened a bit, and Asian Americans made small steps in socioeconomic and residential mobility, gaining access to professions and suburbs. Through these complex dynamics, Asian Americans' place on the racial landscape shifted from being definitively not white to definitively not black, in the words of historian Ellen Wu. But that was insufficient to eradicate racism against Asian Americans. In part, that is because of the weight of history, but it is also because racism found ample grounds for reproduction in the conduct of American colonialism and wars in the Asia Pacific from the 19th century through the 20th. Frederick Douglass understood that the nation faced a choice in the 19th century between a white supremacist vision and a democratic one not just for African-Americans, but for all of humanity. Quote, I want a home here, not only for the Negro, the mulatto and the Latin races, he said in 1869, speaking out against Chinese exclusion. But I want the Asiatic to find a home here in the United States and feel at home here, both for his sake and for ours. Douglas's vision was global and anti-imperialist. He said, it would be a sad reflection upon the laws of nature and upon the idea of justice, to say nothing of a common creator. If four-fifths of mankind, that is the colored races of the world, were deprived of the rights of migration to make room for the one-fifth, that is the white race. If the white race may exclude all other races from this continent, he continued, it may rightfully do the same in respect to all other lands, islands, capes, and continents, and thus have all the world to itself. Thus, what would seem to belong to the whole would become the property only of a part. Here, I hold that a liberal and brotherly welcome to all who are likely to come to the United States is the only wise policy which this nation can adopt. Douglas's vision offers us a path toward a more inclusive future 
should we decide to stand in solidarity against all racisms? His vision was echoed in China in 1901 when the anti-slavery novel Uncle's Tom, Uncle Tom's Cabin was published there, the first American novel to be translated into Chinese. A reviewer in Shanghai wrote, the book is not really about the sufferings of the black race as it is about all races under the whites. The novel is a wake up call to rouse us from a deep dream. Thank you very much. Thank you, May. Um, just a reminder to the audience, please email your questions to the address in the chat and we will um, talk about the questions at the end of the five presentations. Our next speaker is Marie Myung Oak Lee, who is a co-founder and former board president of the Asian American Writers Workshop and is a lecturer in fiction at Columbia University and writer in resident at the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity, where she directs the Asian American Diasporic Writers Series. Her novel, The Evening Hero, is forthcoming from Simon & Schuster and her young adult novel, Finding My Voice, has just been re-released by Soho Press. Um, welcome, Marie. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm grateful for your scholarship, Professor Nye. I'm actually nervous following you. And I wanna thank uh, Vice Pro Provost Mitchell and Executive Vice President Hungerford and my fellow panelists, especially Professor Eli Hisama, who envisioned and organized this panel and for the attendees for taking the time out of your day to engage in a discussion about practical and to combat um, anti-Asian racism. So I'm going to break my talk into two parts. The first about the early years of founding and establishing the Asian American Writers Workshop. I appreciate that um, Professor Nye stopped with a, a literary reference. And this will be followed by how I use the experience in my teaching to give students organizing skills that will extend beyond the classroom. So the Asian American Activism site at Brown University describes the Asian American Writers Workshop as embodying the creative expressions of Asian America. They are not apolitical, they are an activist organization. We started almost 30 years ago as half a dozen Asian American friends, aspiring writers meeting at a Greek diner to workshop, but then eventually a faction of us decided to go bigger to share this community. Our dream was to create a national nonprofit arts organization devoted to creating, publishing, developing and disseminating of creative writing by Asian Americans. This was our first mission statement as we began incorporating and seeking funding in headquarters. We wanted to create a welcoming community space for anyone interested in Asian American writing. We offered low cost workshops, mentorship panels, a bookstore and published a journal. It was open to everyone, whether they were hoping to pursue a career in writing or not. We actually had a lot of people come in and shyly tell us they weren't sure they could be writers, but they wanted to try. So for us, we primarily wanted what writer Viet Nguyen called narrative plenitude. More voices would lead to a more complex and rounded portrayal of our community. And for writers, with a mostly white publishing machine that had its own idea of what Asian American literature should look like, especially the kind to be consumed by white readers, narrative plenitude would also helpfully disrupt the cycle of self-stereotyping in a market that seemed to demand a certain kind of Asian American writing. So with the benefit of hindsight, much of what we've set out to do has been realized. Among the shy people who came in to early workshops was Min Jin Lee. Her novel Pachinko's bestsellerdom has introduced many readers to the Korean diaspora and is now in production with Apple TV and creating a lot of work for Asian and Asian American actors. At the workshop, she says, I studied fiction with Rana Reiko Rizzuto, Jhumpa Lahiri, and Lan Samantha Chang. Not only were my teachers world-class writers, my classmates were the very talented Ed Lin, Lisa Ko, and Kathy Park Hong. It's fair to say that most of us came from backgrounds where writing was not seen as a viable vocation. Nevertheless, my teachers and classmates answered the call to a life of writing with a seriousness as well as joy. And to me, this is why the workshop is so important to my development. 
But what might be less known, but equally formative of those early years, besides getting writers who'd go on to win the Pulitzer and head the famed Iowa Writers Workshop to teach for us, was the AAWW's active participation and collaboration with other social justice organizations. Our first home was with CAV, the Committee Against Anti-Asian Violence, and one of the earliest demonstrations we were involved with was over a murder of a Chinese American artist in Times Square back in 1991. Those first years we were involved with a Miss Saigon demonstration, ACT UP, CAB protests against anti-Asian violence, the Harlem Writers Guild, and we ran a Vincent Chin Memorial Reading. We also partnered with the Cami Lee Leukemia Foundation that addresses a dearth of Asian American bone marrow donors and held screenings at our events. Our activism wasn't something we had an official meeting over. Representation in literature makes it harder to dehumanize people and it's a natural outgrowth of nurturing Asian American writing that it would extend to fighting white supremacy as well as anti LGBTQ hate. So in my sort of half career as a lecturer in creative writing, I've always tried to keep one foot in the Asian American community, even as Asian American studies itself has fluctuated. I've taught at three different universities, shockingly, none of which has a formal Asian American studies program. So for each, I found a kind of interdisciplinary niche in either American studies or ethnic studies. I have been able to teach courses that have an Asian American bent or teach creative writing courses that also look into questions of ethnicity, which is oftentimes thought of as a niche subject in creative writing. At Columbia, I teach the advanced fiction workshop and incorporate learning to run one's own workshop as part of the curriculum. And indeed, I have students who have started their own writing workshops after the class. So in closing, for those who think this recent upsurge in violence against Asian Americans, the murders in Atlanta, or even the fact that the majority of the people in this panel have experienced racist physical assaults, it would be inaccurate also, as Professor Nye has so trenchantly pointed out, to see this as a new phenomenon. Also, the case shown before you in the CAB newsletter in the slide is incredibly similar to what is happening today. Requiring Asian American history in college and in high school, and maybe even before that, is one step. And my co-panelists can speak with um, more expertise to that. But from my esoteric corner of the literary world, three decades ago, as young people in a hurry, my AAWW co-founders and I all wanted to get our work done, but we each ended up devoting a chunk of our 20s getting the AAWW off the ground. I was quasi drafted and served as its board president for 10 years. Curtis Chin, our first executive director and visionary behind the group is just now finishing up his first book length work. Each of the four of us founders is acutely aware of books that went unwritten because we spent so much time organizing. But this highlights the importance of building community, a place where Asian Americans can rest and flourish and find their voices via writing and activism. This is how we continue the work of reimagining. It is a reminder that especially for this generation of students who've had to spend so much time apart, that no matter how magnificent we are on our own, when we come together, even if on Zoom like this, we are stronger as a community. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. <clears throat> and our next speaker is Lydia Liu. She is the Won Sun Tam Professor in the Humanities in the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures, and is also the Director of the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society at Columbia University. Her representative works include The Freudian Robot, Digital Media, and the Future of the Unconscious, The Clash of Empires, and translingual practice. Her book, The Birth of Chinese Feminism, co-edited with Rebecca Carl and Dorothy Ko, is listed as one of the essential reads on feminism by the New York Public Library. And welcome, Lydia. Thank you, Ali. Uh, thank you for organizing this important conversation. In the summer of 2019, I joined a, meet, a meeting of a small group of Columbia faculty and arts and sciences administrators to voice our concerns to the provost 
to the deans and the central administration about the alarming rate of racial profiling by federal law enforcement and intelligence agencies. At that time, we were extremely worried that the new China initiative launched in 2018 by the Justice Department in the name of national security would result in the persecution of a large number of Asian American scientists, particularly faculty and students of Chinese dis descent. FBI Director Christopher Wray himself admitted that they opened a new case related to China every 10 hours and that 50% of the roughly 5,000 active FBI counterintelligence cases, that's about 2,500, uh, were related to China. At that time, they were seeking active cooperation from universities and research institutions asking the administrators to monitor foreign-born students and researchers, most of those of Chinese descent. I recall that in response, President Lee Bollinger published an opinion piece in the Washington Post titled, No, I Won't Start Spying on My Foreign-Born Students. And we were all thinking of this pressure as a First Amendment freedom issue and did not call the China Initiative an anti-Asian measure. We should have called it, called it out then. Today, we're witnessing an incredible upsurge of racist violence against Asian Americans across many states. Is it the unintended consequence of the infamous China Initiative or of uh, related anti-China rhetoric in the press since the start of the pandemic? If uh, we're going to have a fruitful conversation about anti-Asian racism, we need to reckon with the fact that the current wave of violent attacks on Asian Americans and foreign visitors came from above. The White House, the Justice Department, and some well-funded conservative think, think tanks. And this was long before Trump himself got into the obscene habit of repeating China virus to reincite racial hatred. And certainly long before the street level violence reached a scope and magnitude that has become intolerable for our communities and society as a whole. Therefore, when we speak of anti-Asian racism, we need to spell out who is being targeted when they are attacked and ask some hard questions about what gets repeated in public discourse and what gets suppressed at the same time. Why is it? that we feel more confident about finding a cure for the COVID-19 pandemic than we can feel about the overcoming of a most pernicious form of public safety emergency, that is racism from above and racism from below. The good news is that just last week, the Senate voted 92 to six to advance a legislation that would support federal efforts to address hate crimes directed at Asian Americans. It would lead to the creation of a new position at the Justice Department to expedite the review of hate crimes related to the course uh, coronavirus pandemic, expand reporting channels, and require the department to issue guidance to mitigate racially discriminatory language. It's going to take up my precious time to name the six Republican senators who voted against advancing the bill, but I'm going to name them. Tom Cotton, Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley, Roger Marshall, Rand Paul, and Tommy Tuberville. Now, this bill called the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act would represent one step forward in the cause of social justice. During last month's hearing, on discrimination and violence against Asian Americans at the subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, House Judiciary Committee Chairman Jerry Nadler, Democrat of New York, opened the session with these remarks. Quote, the conversation we're having today is long overdue. It is vital that Congress shine a light on this issue the last congressional hearing held on violence against Asian Americans was in 1987 in this committee. 30 years is too long for Congress to leave this issue untouched, end of quote. 
Congressman Nadler puts his finger on the issue when he says, and I quote again, it is important to recognize that this surge did not spontaneously arise, only out of fears regarding the coronavirus pandemic. Some of this blame lies squarely on political leaders who have demonized China, both because of the virus and ongoing geopolitical tensions. And in turn, Asian Americans have fallen in harm's way, end of quote. Clearly, the relentless China bashing we're tired of hearing from the mainstream media is very much part of the story. But Nadler could have pushed his logic further to point out that Asian Americans will always suffer when our country's foreign policy makes us vulnerable through the imperialist wars we make in the Asia Pacific. Remember World War II? Remember the Korean War, remember the Vietnam War, and many other US-led military actions in Asia. In fact, Americans become more vulnerable, not stronger, by our country's imperialist foreign policy. If we continue to disavow the fundamental contradictions between the goal of social justice at home and the objective imperial domination of abroad, the passing of a COVID-19 hate crimes act would not be able to do much for Asian Americans. What we need is something like a world peace act to make our foreign policy accountable um, and stop warmongering in the Asia Pacific. Until then, Asian Americans will not feel safe, not even with the passing of this wonderful legislation we remain apprehensive about the ramped up US aggression toward China and the US military presence throughout the Asia Pacific region with about 300 military bases that surround China. Now, uh, to put this in clear perspective, I recommend a sharp analysis published recently by the journal Nation called Anti-Asian Violence in America is Rooted in US Empire co-authored by Christine Ahn, Terry Park, and Kathleen Richards, where they argue that what's happening today is reflective of a long history of U U US foreign policy in Asia centered on domination and violence fueled by racism. And they make this point clear, quote, belittling and dehumanizing Asians has helped justify endless wars and the expression of US militarism. And this has deadly consequences for Asians and Asian Americans, especially women. If we agree with their, and that was the end of the quote, if we agree with their analysis, as I do, we have to reimagine our course of action and do more than just prosecuting domestic hate crimes. And let me conclude by addressing one of the pre-submitted questions to our panel. It goes, what could an international slash anti-imperial framework to understanding anti-Asian racism violence look like? And this is a great question. My answer is, we need to build coalition and solidarity across the, across the ethnic and racial divide to start a grassroots world peace movement and to make our uh, uh, to make our foreign policy accountable uh, in and then stop the wars in the Asia Pacific and across the world. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia. And just a reminder, the audience may email questions in. I'm monitoring the ones that are coming in. Um, we do have a number of pre-submitted questions. Our fourth speaker is David Henry Huang, whose work includes the plays M. Butterfly, Chinglish, Yellow Face, Golden Child, The Dance in the Railroad, and F.O.B., as well as the Broadway musicals Aida, for which he was co-author, Flower Drum Song in the 2002 revival, and Disney's Tarzan. He's a Tony Award winner and three-time nominee a three-time Obie Award winner, and a three-time finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. He is also the most produced living American opera librettist whose works have been honored with two Grammy Awards. 
David. Hi, thank you, Ellie, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, so some of you may be aware that I am sort of an OG survivor of an anti-Asian hate attack. Uh, for those of you who don't know my story, um, I was walking on my block uh, around 9 p.m. one Sunday night in Brooklyn, um, and I felt something hit me hard on the back of my head. Um, I yelled, what the fuck? And I saw a shadowy figure running away. I figured I wasn't going to chase after them. I'd just gotten some groceries. Um, so I just keep walking home. But instead, I um, found I couldn't walk straight. I veered first into a wall, then into a parked car. Um, and I put my hand up to where I'd been hit and it came away covered in blood. Uh, I remembered from Boy Scouts that if I um, put a put pressure on the wound, that it would uh, stop the bleeding. So I did that, and then I found that I could walk straight. Um, I passed home. I, I we live about two blocks from Brooklyn Hospital, and uh, I thought I should just walk there. And with the help of my wife and daughter, um, I we got there and I passed out and went into convulsions. Um, we subsequently learned that the attacker had severed my vertebral artery and I lost about a third of my blood. Um, the NYPD did not classify this as a hate crime. Um, and about a week later, um, the study of ethnicity and race uh, with May Nye, um, did an event with me um, with George Takei and I showed up in a bandage. So I was much more fortunate than uh, many people who have experienced racist violence. Uh, but what I wanna talk about today is less the incident itself than my own journey to being willing to admit and embrace that I had been the victim of a hate crime. Um, so after I was stabbed, Ron Kim, the assembly member from Queens called a press conference to denounce anti-Asian hate and attacks. And in fact, there were other Asian attacks happening at that time. You may recall a 16 year old Chinese student in Queens who was slashed in the face with a box cutter by a man who was wearing surgical masks and gloves. Um, and uh, assembly member Kim asked if I wanted to participate. Now, because the police hadn't called it a hate crime, I wasn't really sure. Like I didn't want to sensationalize. I didn't want to over politicize my attack. So I declined. And yet when I wrote an article about being stabbed in the neck uh, for the New York Times a month later, it was actually in the style section. I have no idea why they put my stabbing in the style section. But anyway, um, I felt compelled to add um, information about attacks on Asian Americans, and I wrote, some felt that it had been a hate crime. Um, I'm a playwright. I started working on a new musical. Um, I had a concept for a show called Soft Power, which be, would be a reverse King and I, about a Chinese businessman who comes to America and becomes a confidant of Hillary Clinton. Um, and I included an autobiographical character. So I was riding along and all of a sudden I just felt this impulse to write about my stabbing. Um, and I thought, okay, this is never going to make it into the show. This is just something that I guess I need to process. But as the show developed, my stabbing became a critical link uh, between the DHH character being stabbed then um, going into a fever dream, which becomes the musical of the show. And my collaborators, um, particularly Lee Silverman, my director, and Janine Tesori, the composer, kept encouraging me to take my character and my stabbing more seriously because I'd written an autobiographical DHH character before in an earlier show called Soft Power. Um, and I mostly sent my character up. And they really said I needed to 
uh, consider all of the consequences of everything that had happened. Um, so by the time we, we opened initially in Los Angeles and then we brought the show to New York and continued working on it. And by the time we got to New York, the stabbing had become an even, even bigger part of the show. And I realized that what I'd done was kind of created this strange psychodrama where I forced myself to really examine what had happened to me for the good of the show. And so by the time we opened in New York, the show included this monologue from the DHH character. All my life, I've been waiting for this to happen. All my life, I've walked down streets where people have assumed I don't belong. All my life, I feared I was marked for something terrible because of this face. And now it's finally happened. And yet, I didn't die. And when the worst thing in the world actually happens, but you somehow survive, you feel, at least for a moment, like you can do anything. So I wrote this show. So Soft Power did well in our run at the Public Theater here in New York pre-pandemic. Uh, we were a finalist for the Pulitzer, um, thank you Columbia, and uh, we were nominated for a Grammy. Um, and there was a wonderful panel on soft power that was organized by English and Comparative Literature um, here at Columbia. And we do plan to return to New York post pandemic. But by the time the show had opened, the DHH character in the show was a survivor of a hate crime. But how about the DHH in real life? In October 2020, Marie Lee sent me an email asking if I thought I'd been the victim of a hate crime. And even then I wrote, honestly, my stabber was never caught. So no one knows for certain whether it was some sort of hate crime. And you know, after Georgia, I realized, oh, the police never call anything a hate crime. Um, the, you know, in, in Georgia, the mass murderer said it wasn't a hate crime. So the police were like, okay, we believe him. Um, and by the way, I also have to add that the NYPD did a pretty terrible job investigating my case. Uh, and again, my assailant was never caught. Uh, they did manage to clear my wife as a potential suspect, but then at some point my sister called to find out what was going on and they said, oh, we couldn't find anyone, so we closed the case. So from my view, more policing is not the answer. So now I'm willing to embrace the fact that I was the victim of a hate crime, but why had I been reluctant? I think there is a sense of shame that we sometimes feel when we are confronted with racism. Did I bring it on myself? Was I somehow too Asian? And not wanting to believe that I could be targeted because of my race. The writer Deep Tron wrote in American Theater Magazine um, just last week, being Asian in America is a continual process of being gaslit by the people around you and most insidiously by yourself. When the wider culture tells you that your stories, your face, your people are not worthy of attention, you make yourself smaller. You tell yourself that your feelings, your pain, your rage is not worthy of attention. After all, if you're invisible, you can't bleed. This last year has reminded us again that even if we're invisible, we can bleed. And the big lie of American racism is that if you work hard and you play by the rules, you will be accepted. What the last year has reminded us again is that accommodation can never defeat white supremacy and systemic racism, only by organizing with our BIPOC siblings and our white allies can we hope to defeat this pandemic and of uh, racism. And that is what we need to reimagine. Thank you. Thank you. And our final speaker is Akemi Kochiyama. Akemi is a scholar, activist, and community builder who currently serves as the Director of Advancement at the Manhattan Country School. 
I wanted to welcome the seventh and eighth graders who are here today from MCS. She is also co-director of the Yuri Kochiyama Archives Project and co-editor of Passing It On, a memoir by Yuri Kochiyama. She recently published Reflections on My Grandma Yuri, Malcolm X, and the Past, Present, and Future of Black Asian Solidarity in That Which Remains. Welcome, Akemi. Hi, well, thank you for having me. Um, <clears throat> In, in thinking about what's happening with anti-Asian racism and violence in America right now and my own background and experience, um, I wanted to approach uh, Grace Lee Boggs' idea of visionary organizing and reimagining as a way to frame the, the opportunity uh, for BIPOC solidarity and community building in the present moment. Um, I want to think about what solidarity looks like when we reimagine our future with a better understanding um, of how our past, what our past uh, and present connections are. Um, then I, I watched uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates uh, last week talk about uh, Black and Japanese American uh, uh, ja Black and Japanese American reparations uh, at the Ito Center at USC last weekend. And I was struck by a comment he made about the model minority idea being a contradiction in terms, and yet such a powerful and pervasive stereotype that seems so relevant now. Um, at the end of the talk, the moderator asked Coates to talk about pervasive racism and, and, ima and imagining a way for our nation to move forward. And Coates uh, responded with asking questions of his own, which I actually thought but were useful for thinking about our conversation today. Um, the, the two questions I thought were useful that I, I wanna come back to are, what is the story we are going to tell? And what are the communities we want to build? Um, this, this all made me think about the stories I have to tell, the, the communities I want to build, and the opportunity, the present moment of rampant, uh, frightening and highly publicized racial violence against Asian Americans. Um, it provides all of us to, to reimagine, understand, and fully appreciate the harmfulness and the impact of racial and cultural stereotypes on violence in, in many forms, and not just on Asian Americans, but on many oppressed communities in America. Um, I, uh, so in the next few minutes I have left, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I've learned from my family's journey in community building and solidarity work, um, some thoughts I have on the impact of pervasive stereotypes, and also on reimagining what solidarity could look like in response to anti-Asian racism and violence now. Um, as a fourth generation Harlemite of Black and Japanese descent, who grew up in a large multicultural family with a broad and diverse extended community of friends and activists uh, within a, uh, a larger culture of radical black nationalism and anti-imperialism and whose family, my Japanese family has resided um, in Harlem on the same street for nearly 100 years. Um, I, I come to this conversation with an understanding, a deep understanding of black Asian solidarity um, and from a perspective that is personal and, and political. Um, my grandparents, Bill and Yuri Koshiyama did not arrive in Harlem as a savvy political activist. Um, like most second generation Japanese Americans, they both grew up as patriotic citizens, uh, were not able to fully really understand the racist implications of what happened to them under Executive Order 9066 until many years later. Um, but their experience of incarceration during World War II definitely made them begin to um, and America differently. Um, visiting a segregated army base where black and Japanese uh, troops were training in a segregated Mississippi town um, during the war was the first time my grandmother Yuri be actually became aware of Jim Crow and the long uh, history of institutionalized racism in America. Um, I remember her talking about how that impacted her as a young woman, uh, seeing that for the first time during World War II. And I remember her saying, um, what happened to Japanese Americans after Pearl Harbor made me see the world uh, and America with entirely new eyes, Japanese American eyes. Um, Immediately after the war, my grandparents uh, married and they moved to my grandfather's hometown, New York City, and they settled in the predominantly uh, black, uh, black Amsterdam uh, housing projects in Midtown Manhattan. Um, 
Later in 1960, my grandparents moved their, their growing family of six children to the Manhattanville housing projects on 126th Street and Broadway, which is actually the same street that my grandfather, Bill, had grown up on uh, since he was a child. Um, it was upon arriving in Harlem that Bill and Yuri first got seriously involved in activism, uh, initially through their membership in the Harlem Parents Committee and the enrollment of their entire family in the Harlem Freedom School uh, as soon as it opened. Um, Yuri's education, my grandmother Yuri's education and her involvement in these organizations um, later led her to participate at, in and support a wide range of community organizations, as well as African-American, Asian-American and third world movements for civil rights and human rights, ethnic studies and uh, against the war in Vietnam among many other things um, she became involved in. Um, in 1963, Yuri met Malcolm X, what she later called her political awakening. She joined his group, the Organization for Afro-American Unity, uh, to work for racial and human rights, their friendship, their intellectual and political exchanges, and her education as a member of the OWAU radically changed her political focus, um, which then became more international in scope. And she moved from becoming, uh, she became passionately committed to black nationalist struggles in America and Africa, to supporting uh, Puerto Ricans fights for independence, to countless other international liberation struggles. Um, Malcolm's impact on Yuri's uh, political evolution was profound. Um, she transformed, it transformed her uh, from a liberal civil rights activist to a revolutionary anti-imperialist. Um, I, I tell this part of my, uh, of my family's personal and political story as because it's one example, right, of many narratives and histories that exist in America. And that give us, I think, an opportunity to reimagine Black and Asian interactions beyond conflict and beyond stereotypes and prejudices um, that I think are purposeful in serving to limit our ability to really know each other, um, to build solidarity uh, and effective movements that, that will protect and serve us. Um, I think sharing and documenting these types of stories um, are, are in the, the counter narratives um, is a critical element of, of building solidarity work going forward. Um, toward the effort to reimagine, I think, um, the past, present and future of BIPOC solidarity in response to Asian hate and by, uh, racial violence in all forms, and toward um, all oppressed peoples, I think the most important lesson uh, that I could have learned from my grandparents' li li lives and their work is how important it is to really connect with all kinds of people um, and to learn as much as you can about other people's histories. Um, all the meetings, the demonstrations, the events they attended and organized, the different people they met and worked with. Um, it created a, cont a contagious sense of hope, of radical love, of lifelong friendships and relationships they nurtured. Um, and it, that was the fuel that kept their belief in humanity um, and their passion for, passion for justice going all those years. Um, what always amazed me was that my grandmother actually um, took a lot of time and, and got to know every person she met um, at every event. event. Uh, she would note uh, your interest, she would collect your contact information, um, and then she would stay in touch with you like forever. Um, and she was uh, really uh, diligent and disciplined about entering each person she met um, in her address book and she would organize you, you know, organize that by geographic location, your political or cultural interests, and any other information she had. Um, I think uh, it's important to, to do that though, because she was able to engage people in community, invite them into other networks and communities by continuing to do that. Um, I think if I've learned anything from folks like my grandmother and so many of the activists um, and educators um, I've had the opportunity to meet over the years, um, it's that working and living in community with people who are different uh, from, your, from ourselves is, is critical to breaking down dangerous stereotypes um, and prejudices. Um, and it helps us all to develop a sense of mutual respect and understanding of where our lives and experiences intersect and overlap, you know, the more we know about each other. Um, whether, 
it's the model minority or <clears throat> the dragon lady or the racist, racist Asian shop merchant or the Central American immigrant or the black criminal, all racial and, and cultural stereotypes are harmful and can, can have profound and violent impacts um, as we've seen uh, when those stereotypes are held by a police officer or a teacher or an immigration officer or a judge or a juror or as we've learned any person with a gun. Um, stereotypes uh, which are so perpetuated by the media and, and even in some of the most prestigious educational institutions in this country, they, they lead to acts of violence, but also to the perpetuation of systemic racism and violence in many forms. I think uh, from shooting Asian women in massage parlors to murdering uh, countless Asia, innocent black and brown children in the street to putting children in cages to unjustly incarcerating millions of black and brown and poor people in prisons and, descent and detention centers across the country to purposefully holding communities in multi-generational poverty. Um, racial and cultural stereotypes in America uh, function to engender and perpetuate systemic racism into BIPOC conflicts and violence. Um, I think what's important about this moment right now is that it provides us with a real opportunity to reimagine many things, um, to reimagine uh, how to work more purposefully um, with each other, to learn each other's histories um, so that we can understand more and, um, and find places of, of common experience and oppression. Um, I think in particular, I think I wanna end with like sort of looking at two ways we can look at this. I think uh, there are those people who didn't know before this moment um, about racism against Asians and didn't believe or know that Asians experienced racism uh, or didn't know the extent of it, um, now you know, right? Um, Asian American history and stereotypes do fit with, uh, within a broader historical and political context of racism. And this is your opportunity to learn more about it. Um, and, and to really look at how the history of anti-Asian racism and exclusion, how does, it, how does it fit into the longer history of institutionalized racism and economic disenfranchisement of BIPOC people in general in the United States, because it does fit into that story. Um, also, what is the impact of seemingly harmless or accepted cultural uh, or racial stereotypes like the model minority myth? Um, what is the impact of those kinds of, of stereotypes on the lives of people um, and your own humanity um, if you accept them? Um, I think for Asians and Asian Americans um, who are new to social justice, to the anti-racism struggle, um, this is also a, a, a real opportunity um, to reimagine your own practice, uh, your own practice in solidarity. Um, and I think uh, to really think about what does authentic anti-racism um, and solidarity work truly look like and uh, how can we all better educate ourselves to be in solidarity um, in response to racism and violence against all BIPOC, you know, to everyone and all oppressed people, um, whenever and wherever it is happening. So, you know, as an Asian American and you know, and a person of African American descent, to see uh, a lot of Asians, uh, more visible Asians, stepping up and and speaking about racism is really good to see. But I would, I think that you know, the the test will be and the thing that that I think will really help with solidarity and with anti racism uh, and inter BIPOC uh, tensions is if people continue to see Asians at the forefront of anti racism work um, as we move forward in and in solidarity with other groups. Um, and yeah, and I just want to sort of, I guess that's where I'll end and, and hopefully we can have more of a conversation. Thank you everyone for these great, um, thoughtful, inspiring, valuable remarks. Um, so we have about 20 minutes for discussion. A number of questions have come in from the audience, so I'm going to read them. Some are specific to some of the panelists and others are more general. Um, so this is um, referring to David's presentation. I'm not submitting a question, but I'd like to applaud and thank David Henry Huang for sharing his story. It took a lot of courage and strength. Although I did not go through something as horrific as David, I have also encountered experiences where I could not verbalize because of my Asian upbringing. 
at a young age, we are taught to internalize and not cause trouble, even at the detriment of our own health. Um, so thank you for bringing David as a panelist, and thank you, David, for sharing a painful experience. Um, and then relatedly, since um, we're thinking about David's remarks for now, this is a separate comment. On Monday, I was told by NYPD when reporting an attempted assault by a hateful white man that things only count as hate crimes if a specific slur or specific anti-Asian language was used at the time of the attack. As DHH mentioned, the police literally never call anything a hate crime. How do you suggest organizing to change this? More policing is not the answer, but how do we respond, let alone collect records on incidents like this? And in your view, what are short-term solutions? What are long-term solutions? Um, well, certainly one thing to do is to report to the various Asian American organizations that have been um, uh, founded or have existed for a long time, uh, whether it's Stop a uh, API Hate or places like uh, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Can I add something, Ellie? Um, I think that's a really important point. Um, hate crime is a very specific criminal category. And I actually don't use the term, I use hate attack. Um, I, I was shoved on Broadway about a month ago, a uh, hard shove and the guy ran off and I didn't see who he was. He didn't say anything, but I knew what was going on. Um, and and I, I called it a hate attack. I mean, for, I'm very lucky I wasn't injured, but I think that, you know, um, I don't think more policing is the answer. I don't think um, uh, piling charges on people is the answer. Um, I think we have to have different kinds of solutions that promote education and solidarity and structural changes. Um, but I, I think that, you know, this question of what is a hate crime is, is vexing because it is a very specific kind of cr crime that has certain criteria. Um, and, and, I, and it gets us into a whole rabbit hole about policing, you know, um, extra charges on people, extra punishments. So I have been just using the term hate attack or hatred. Um, so I don't go down that path, but I think it's a really important discussion because some people do want more police in our communities. And I, I think that's something we have to struggle through. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this question of policing is really important as we think about the verdict, which is very rare to have yesterday's verdict um, come down that way. Uh, this is a question for Lydia Liu. Thank you for your insightful remarks. How can we convince American civ civilians and politicians to stop US empiricist advances in the Asian Pacific when they will often point to the authoritarian nature of the Chinese Communist Party as a national and global threat that needs to be stopped? It's not easy. Um, I don't. I, I don't think we should mix issues um, here. Um, China has done things that we disapprove of. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that the U.S. should go there and 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 start something. And uh, how do we do this? The thing that really bothers me is uh, what uh, the media have been doing. Um, uh, there, there's this relentless attacks on China. And I'm not saying that they should stop attacking China. <laughs> uh, what I'm pointing to is the contradiction here. The Biden administration uh, uh, has done uh, some things, you know, starting from the executive order um, to uh, some of the other measures to uh, really voice their uh, protection and support of Asian Americans. However, their foreign policy is the same. Um, they withdraw troops from Afghanistan in order to focus on China. What? So you have a contradiction here. If the Biden administration, if those who voted 92 
senators who voted for the legislation that I mentioned, should they also not look at their voting pattern on foreign policy issues? Are they contradicting themselves? And so there are many things people can do, but if you're talking about asking about the grassroots, I think education is one of the ways in which we can clarify things. And so people are not and unnecessarily suffering from a certain uh, uh, ignorance as to what is happening to them. People get attacked. Um, is it a personal attack? Uh, maybe not. Uh, you simply represent an image of someone um, on the other continent. And so we need to really think about the connections between the foreign policy we continue to adopt and the, some of the um, uh, uh, legislations and some of the social justice, social justice programs that we are trying to uh, um, push. And so the first step is to see the contradiction for what it is. Um, so I wanted to read two questions, one that came in um, to the pre-registration, one that came in just now. So um, the one that just now is, I would be interested in hearing more from the panelists about what they see as the roadblocks we need to overcome in building a stronger coalition among Asian and black brown minorities. And the other question is number 15 on the list. What is your opinion on the best way to eliminate anti-Black bias as a reaction to the anti-Asian hate crimes? Would anyone like to address either? A couple, I mean, I'd love to hear what other people have to say. I guess one of the things I would say is just um, in terms of the question about the uh, is, is looking at these statistics, understanding um, one of the things I hope people are aware of is that, you know, although what we see on the media, um, when what we're seeing um, is mostly Black people attacking Asians, actually to statistically, um, most of the attacks, uh, so my understanding, uh, according at least as of last week, is most of the attacks against Asians have not been by Black people. There's there have been more attacks by white people than Black people. And I think that's like, just look at the statistics, don't just watch the news, right? Like, look at the breakdown, because I think it's important for Asians to know that, that that's an exaggeration, that it is just Black people attacking them. And I think that's a really critical piece. And I think that should us think a lot more again about how it serves the media, um, why it serves the media to um, exacerbate uh, tensions between Black and Asian people. Um, and I think that's a really critical, critical piece not to just absorb it and believe it, but understand um, what is at play. I, I think what Akemi is saying is really, really important. Um, the media plays a really outsized role in uh, finding <laughs> Uh, divisions anywhere it can so we can sow more divisions amongst us. But I think this is also something we have to confront. You know, um, we live in a racist society and every, every person in America is susceptible to racist ideas. So we know, we all know, those of us who are Asian Americans, we know plenty of Asian Americans who have racist ideas about Black people and about Latinos. And it should not surprise us that other people of color also have imbibed some of those ideas. And um, so I think we need education and we also need to, I don't know, I mean, I think that it's, an, to me, it's an interesting phenomenon about, um, and I, I think back to 9-11, when there was an attempt by American politicians to rally all Americans and they made a really big deal about blacks, Asians, Latinos and whites against the Muslim terrorist, right? The Muslim terrorist became the outsider that we as Americans, multiracial America could all unite against. And I think there's maybe something a little similar in right now in that for African-Americans who are horribly oppressed, right? Um, but, their citizenship is undeniable. 
maybe second class citizenship, it may be a citizenship bereft of any substantial benefit. But to say, at least I'm a citizen and you don't belong, has a kind of wage, you know? Um, and so I think that it's, uh, it's something for us that that's important to understand that going back to the point I was making before, race, there's not just a racism as a singular thing, there are racisms. And we have to understand how all of them operate in this very chaotic um, and sometimes disturbing manners so we can untangle them. So I, th I think that there's more solidarity than not. I was really moved yesterday watching um, George Floyd's family speak after the conviction. I was really, really moved by the family members and by, um, by their lawyer because said, they said, this is a day uh, where we can approach justice, but not just for black people, for all people. And they were very clear that this was not just a struggle for their family or their community, but for all people of color and all humanity. And I think that that's, that's how we have to take up that message, I think, as we, as we move forward and struggle for justice for everybody. Thanks. Um, I was trying to paste into the chat a comment about April 25th, a day of action and solidarity with Asian lives. There's another piece, but it didn't paste in. Maybe someone can try to paste in the first part of that because there's a link to a nice flyer. Okay, we still have um, some time for questions. And I wanted to bring in um, a student question. So what can we do to improve safety wellness collect connection allyship for students both off and on campus? That's question two. So all of us work with students. Any suggestions? Uh, I want to take this opportunity to point out um, there's a, a one of one of the actresses from the soft power company, Gina Quintos, uh, has created something called the buddy system. And um, you can go to their website at um, thebuddysystemnyc.org. Um, and it's a way for people, APIs, who feel vulnerable, who, are, who need somebody to accompany them on a walk or give them a ride uh, to be matched. Um, and they specifically, Gina specifically said, you know, say to, the people at Columbia to the students and faculty and staff. If anybody needs support, um, to check out our website. So um, that's one concrete initiative that's going on right now of many actually that are happening. And um, could someone just put the link in the chat? I know you sent it around before for the buddy system. No, I can do that. Okay, thanks. Um, so back to questions. Uh, I saw one here. Uh, oh, this is for you, David, from the eighth grade at Manhattan Country School. How did David feel in the moment when he got stabbed? What can we do at home to help? Thank you so much for hosting this panel in solidarity. Um, I, I mean, I was just really shocked. I mean, you just, it, and whether or not it's a literal stabbing or someone yelling a racial slur or someone whispering something under their breath, I think that's how a lot of us experience these incidents as sort of coming out of the blue, what just happened? Did that actually happen to me? Um, and it's important to what we can do is we can uh, recognize that these things do happen to us and we should talk about them and we should share our experiences so we know we're not alone and we know it's not our fault and we work together against the real problem, which is the sort of, which is the systemic racism that we're talking about. Yes, I think for some of us, we are not supposed to cause trouble. We're supposed to keep our head down. And you know, if something happens to you, it just disappears if you don't talk about it. It didn't happen, which is not the case. And 
Oh, man, I'm so sorry to hear about what happened to you. So Broadway on 113th, there was just a man screaming anti-Asian comments, specifically anti-Chinese comments, to someone who passed right in front of me. And the question was, do I report it? Do I just try to get away from him? I didn't know what to do. And then it, there wasn't a clear reporting structure. So now there is something. I think we do need to make a mark and have these um, have these go down just in terms of our records, but to know that it's it's prevalent and that it happens to your teachers and it happens to your students and it happens to your friends. And I, I wanna add something to this conversation. It goes back to what Lydia was talking about, about American foreign policy. And, and I wanna, um, I guess I want us to think about what role Columbia as an institution uh, can play, what are our, what are the possibilities and also what are the limitations? I was really heartened when President Bollinger wrote that piece in the Washington Post because most universities are throwing their Chinese scholars under the bus. And so it was, it was the really right thing that he did. Um, at the same time, um, Columbia is an elite institution that is very invested in American power structures. So we have, a, we have a situation where we have the classroom and we have the campus as a place where we can have um, honest discussion. We can ask hard questions. Those of us on the faculty who are lucky and, and um, privileged to have tenure, you know, we have academic freedom. We can teach anything we want in our classes and we can ask really hard questions in our classes and we can get our students to think about those contradictions that Lydia is talking about. At the same time, I think this university is only gonna go so far to challenge imperialism, war. You know, we have a longstanding struggle on this campus over support for Palestinian rights um, and, uh, and many other issues, right? So the students have fought really hard for certain things like divestment from uh, big oil, you know, climate change, you know, these issues come before us and it takes a lot of struggle to get the institution behind these things. And so what I'm getting at is I think that we can't, um, we can't, well, this is what I wanna say. I wanna say that as co-director of ethnic studies at Columbia, we are completely marginalized in the structure of this university. We, have, we get no respect, we get no faculty lines, our budget hasn't increased in 10 years. We are, we are the institutional embodiment of racism at Columbia within our institution. And we have begged the, we, we have had two, two hunger strikes of students in the last 20 years to try to improve ethnic studies. And so these are the battles that we have to wage so that we can ask the hard questions. We can Get, we can speak truth to power. We can get our students to think critically about these things. But you know, the, the institution is a place to challenge and to learn, and it's also a place of struggle. So I would also encourage uh, everybody in the university right now who is now more aware about racism against Asian Americans, that having panels like this is a wonderful thing to bring these issues to the community. But we need institutional change as well. We have to deal with institutional racism at Columbia in the form of the lack of support for ethnic studies. So I've said it, <laughs> um, but this is, this is where the rubber, I think, hits the road. So thank you for listening. You know, and to add to that, I think um, the structure needs to be there's so much about oh, identity politics and the idea that Asian American studies is just for Asian students, but actually the structure is Asian American studies is good for everybody and it needs to just be part, you know, part of American history and the different disciplines. I think so quickly it's a, oh, the ethnic stuff, we'll just leave it over here and it's kind of a nice elective, but I think this needs to be seen as critical for liberal, liberal arts studies just in general. Yes, and there are conversations about the core. So Columbia is a very famous core with music, art, history, literature. Where are the Asian American writers in Lit Hum? Where are the Asian American composers in Music Hum? Um, 
and I see that we have to wind down soon, but I wanted to just um, say first thank you all for joining us today. I think we've um, seen the great interest in this conversation at the high point was 333 people on this call, so I trust that there will be more conversations. Um, I wanted to thank Amy Hungerford, Dennis Mitchell, um, and also Kristen Barnes, Adina Berrios-Brooks for supporting um, our work, um, and in the CED, Catherine Johnston, Natalie Navarez, and Rose Rizagian. I also appreciate the behind the scenes help of Gareth Cordery, who has done amazing things with designing the beautiful booklet, and he has worked magic with uh, assisting with this event. Um, I wanted to also say that there are uh, excellent resources in the Weatherhead East Asian Institute. If someone could put the link in the chat, they have a wonderful um, web page of resources for their readings, etc. And last, because a question came up about why are there no scientists or people trained in science, official scientists on this panel, um, the Weatherhead Institute's working with the Dean of Natural Sciences on a series of events for next year that focuses on Sino-US scientific collaboration and Asian, Asian American scientists and discrimination. So I trust that this event is part of a lot larger conversation and series of events that will continue in 2021, 2022, and beyond. Um, and I'm going to turn it back to Dennis Mitchell now. Thank you, Ellie, very much. And, and my incredible thanks to the panel for such a robust conversation, uh, the Q&A today. Uh, and you're absolutely right. This is the, the first of many conversations that we will have. Um, I'm very grateful to the audience of all of those who attended. Uh, please, we will have a recording available as soon as it gets cleaned up. We will uh, have it available. I believe you can, you'll be able to find it on our website. You can follow us here on any of these uh, social media sites and be able to access it. Um, and we wish you the best and everyone stay safe, please. <laughs>